In this video, I am making the case for why I think psilocybin is the best psychedelic. And by the end of this video, you'll understand the reasons for why I think it stands apart from ketamine, MDMA, LSD, ayahuasca, and ibogaine. Hi, I'm Dr. Tracy Kim Townsend. I'm a licensed medical doctor and psilocybin facilitator, and I teach about the healing potential of psychedelic medicine. And you'll want to stick around until the very end because the last reason may just change how you think about human evolution itself. And just so you know, although MDMA and ketamine are technically not classic psychedelics in the sense that they don't primarily activate the 5-HC2A serotonin receptor system, they're often included in the broader conversation about psychedelics in general because they alter consciousness and are being studied as alternatives for mental health treatment. So let's start with a simple but important question. Is it legal? For the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to consider only the U.S. federal and state laws. Psilocybin mushrooms have been legalized for facilitated therapeutic use in licensed centers in the U.S. states of Oregon and Colorado. Colorado has also legalized home cultivation for personal use. While psilocybin is still Schedule One at the federal level within the U.S., the FDA has granted psilocybin breakthrough therapy status in 2018 and in 2019, which has legalized it for clinical research studies at the federal level. Meanwhile, the rest of the psychedelics are federally Schedule One and therefore illegal to use, except for ketamine. And some important caveats to know are that Indigenous plant-based psychedelics like ayahuasca can be legally accessed for religious use in the United States under the Freedom of Religion Act. MDMA is currently in phase three clinical trials for the treatment of PTSD and can be legally accessed as a participant in one of those studies. And here's the thing about ketamine that I think everyone should know. It is legal today for treatment-resistant depression, but mainly because it went through a regulatory backdoor. It was originally approved as a dissociative anesthetic in the 1970s, and so clinicians have been able to prescribe it off-label for mental health without it having to go through new regulatory approval. Next, let's compare things from the clinical evidence angle. Psilocybin is the most clinically studied classic psychedelic, leading the modern psychedelic renaissance in terms of volume, funding, and regulatory momentum. There have been over 200 clinical trials on psilocybin. Institutions like Johns Hopkins, NYU, UCSF, and Imperial College of London have shown that one to two doses of psilocybin combined with therapy leads to rapid and sustained reductions in depression, anxiety, PTSD, and existential distress with effects lasting 12 months or more. How does this compare to the other psychedelics? Ketamine also has hundreds of published studies to back up its rapid antidepressant effects with an impressive 50 to 70% response rate after a single infusion in treatment-resistant depression, and is particularly helpful in the case of suicidal ideation. But these effects often fade within one to two weeks and require several sessions with ongoing dosing. MDMA also has hundreds of peer-reviewed studies, but its stimulant properties, abuse potential, and concerns about neurotoxicity and cardiotoxicity have caused regulators to call for more studies to assess its safety profile. Ayahuasca and Ibogaine are no doubt powerful, but currently lag behind in terms of high quality clinical trials in the US. Stanford, NYU, and MAPS have expressed interest in pursuing future Ibogaine trials, especially for opioid use disorder, but human trials have been slow to develop, mostly due to concerns about cardiac risk. So in terms of rigorous clinical validation that show that it is scalable to a general population, psilocybin currently leads the field. So let's compare sourcing and sustainability now. Where does it come from? Around 200 species of psilocybin mushrooms grow naturally all over the planet. They're found on every continent except for Antarctica. They're easy to cultivate, they require minimal resources, and are therefore one of the most sustainable psychedelic sources on planet Earth. In contrast, ketamine and MDMA are synthetic molecules that are manufactured in labs from petroleum-derived chemical. Ayahuasca is made from plants native to the Amazon jungle that take about 10 years to mature, which does introduce concerns about overharvesting and stressing already delicate rainforest ecosystems. Ibogaine is derived from the iboga plant, which is slow-growing and also vulnerable to overharvesting, though there are synthetic versions available. 
Psilocybin mushrooms offer a natural, sustainable pathway to healing without displacing indigenous traditions or damaging delicate ecosystems. Next, let's ask the question of how safe is it? Psilocybin has a uniquely low toxicity profile. It's virtually impossible to overdose on mushrooms. The lethal dose is orders of magnitude higher than any human can practically consume. And even at really high doses, there are no heart, liver, kidney, or brain toxicity effects. And because there is little activation of the brain's mesolimbic reward system, the brain circuit tied to addiction, psilocybin is also not habit-forming and therefore has very low abuse potential. There's no evidence of physiological dependency, and in controlled settings, serious adverse events are exceedingly rare. For example, here in Oregon, under the Psilocybin Services Act, we have served over 10,000 clients, and the adverse events rate has been 0.13%. Now let's compare that to ketamine, which does carry risks of bladder and kidney toxicity with repeated use. It also does have abuse potential given its activation of our mesolimbic dopamine reward circuit, leading to risks of drug-seeking behavior. MDMA has concerns about cardiovascular toxicity and neurotoxicity at high or repeated doses and also has abuse potential given its mechanism of action and unbalanced euphoric effects. And Ibogaine also carries a serious risk of fatal cardiac arrhythmias with fatality rates in observational studies as high as 1 in 300 treatments, leading many to recommend that intravenous magnesium be given as a preventative safety measure. This medicine, like all psychedelics, really should be approached with the utmost in respect and care. But beyond legality, science, sustainability, and safety, there's something even more fundamental about psilocybin. Psilocybin mushrooms are indigenous to all people, not tied to a single culture, region, or lineage. They can be grown anywhere, without factories, plantations, endangered plants, or pharmaceutical conglomerates. Some researchers, like Terence McKenna, even suggest that psilocybin played a role in human evolution itself. The Stone Ape theory proposes that early hominids who consumed mushrooms gained advantages in visual acuity, pattern recognition, and social cohesion possibly accelerating the evolution of language, culture, and consciousness itself. Whether or not that theory holds up under scrutiny, the fact remains psilocybin is uniquely compatible with human healing, meaning making, and transformation. It's not just a drug, it's part of our biological and spiritual inheritance, and I think of it as the people's medicine. In a world desperate for quick fixes, numbing agents, and endless prescriptions, psilocybin offers something radical. It's not just reshaping psychiatry, it's reshaping all of modern medicine as we know it. If you found this video valuable, please like and subscribe for more. If you agree or disagree with me or this brought up any questions for you, please let me know in the comments below. In upcoming videos, we'll dive deeper into how psilocybin changes our brains and how to think critically about the next wave of psychedelic medicines. Thank you for watching.